<clears throat> so I just started the recorder and we are starting the class now. And let's see. Let's get rid of this. There we go. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do today is to finish up how we figure out K3 using that really obscure formula that we talked about last time. <clears throat> I hope you guys still remember which obscure expression that I'm talking about. If you refer to the announcement, it is already there. Okay, so that's basically what we are starting this class with is this notation. But we're going to use this notation to figure out K3. And we already know what K3 is supposed to look like. So this is just another way to figure out K3 using the carry look ahead method. So do we have any questions before I start that process? No questions? All right. <clears throat> so I think last time I talked about how the big OR and the big N notation, including also you know, the sigma notation, is really specifying a loop. And the loop is indexed or it is controlled by the index variable, where it starts, where it's supposed to end, and then each for each iteration of the loop, it generates a specific term, and then we end up with a bunch of terms. The question is, what do we do with all the terms? If it's a big OR notation, then we are logically ORing or using disjunction to connect all the terms. If it's a big N, then we have conjunction, we use conjunction to connect all those terms. If it is a sigma notation, we're adding all those terms. If it's a pi notation, we are multiplying all those terms. So in other words, <clears throat> we are just generating a bunch of terms, and then we have one operator to connect all the terms together. So in terms of concept, are we doing OK with these notations, the sigma notation, the pi notation, and so on? OK. <clears throat> so with that in mind, I am going to use a different tool today to explain this because I think this tool is really helpful for uh, doing this kind of explanation. It's Joplin, which allows me to use uh, Markdown on the left-hand side to specify the content, and then you can focus on the right-hand side because the right-hand side is, quote, unquote, the rendered your product, uh, which is you know, what you should be focusing on. Are we doing okay so far with that too? Okay, all right. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go back to my notes here. <clears throat> and I am going to extract the formula of this thing, which is you know, kind of something that we should be familiar with or more or less familiar with already, <clears throat> and see if Joplin can accept that. So we'll, we'll take a look. Because I wanted to show here so that we can keep an eye on you know, what we are working on. And the, I, the and it cannot do the entire thing. Let me see if I can just kind of get rid of that and get rid of the end align. OK, nope, still does not like that. It doesn't understand the big V notation, looks like. Uh, EOF got M percent. Oh, OK, I see. So it doesn't like the M percent notation, which is kind of like a tab character in this context. So yes, so we get it back. Excellent. All right. So in this case, I'm just going to say that you know try figure out figure out what is K of three. So if we want to figure out K of three, what do you think N is? N is two. Okay. So that means you know, we say N equals to two. <clears throat> So what I'll do is I'm going to focus on one side of the what looks like a plus sign here, but that's actually representing or because you know, I use the alternate representation. So that means you know, this operator that looks like a plus is really a logical or or disjunction. So what I'll do is I'm going, I will try to figure out this whole thing first, okay? This entire side from here all the way up to here. That's my first thing to do, okay? <clears throat> All right, so the first thing I do is I'm going to say, what if I is 0? Well, when I is 0, then we have your know, G of 0, right? B 
because you know this g of zero is right here. It is part of the expression that I'm generating per iteration of the big or notation. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> but that's not the only thing in that expression. We also have an implicit end here because between the g of i and this expression here, there's no symbol, there's no operator here, which means it looks like multiplication, but looks, what looks like multiplication is actually conjunction or logical end in this context. So we are logically ending G0 with whatever this you know, um, big N notation is generating. So now we look at the big N notation. For the big N notation, J as an index is going to start with whatever I plus one is. So what do you think you know, is the first value of j in the first iteration? It's one, exactly, okay. <clears throat> so when j equals to one, so when j equals to one, um, then we have p of j, which is just p of one. So now we have p of one. And then in the next iteration, j equals to two. Or do we even have j equals to two in this case? The answer is yes, we have j equals to two because we are supposed to stop when j equals n, n is two, so j equals to two is the next iteration. Then we end up with p of two, like so. Is that okay? All right. So what do we do with these three terms? g0, okay, g0 is outside of the big N notation, but it is ended with whatever is inside the big N notation. And then whatever is in the big N notation, meaning P1 and P2, those two are also ended together because they are a part of the big N expression. Is that making any sense? All right, yes. Uh, yes, I believe so. <clears throat> okay, sure. All right, so now we know that when I equals to zero, the term that we are generating, you know, is G0, P1, and P2. Um, yeah, I have to scroll a little bit here. There we go. <clears throat> so now our concern becomes what if what happens when I equals to one? So when I equals to one, I cannot show the uh, the original formula anymore, but I hope you guys remember what the formula looks like. So inside here, okay, we have a G of I that is outside of the big N notation. So we have G of one now because I equals to one. And then inside the big N notation, J starts with I plus one, which in this case is starting with two. When I equals to two, we have basically just your P of two, and that's it, okay? Because your two is the end, two is N, and that is where we stop the inner loop you know, with the big N notation. Are we still doing okay so far with that idea? Yes? Say that one more time. Can we put? Uh, yes, it is J, not I, sorry. You are correct. So this is when J equals two. So J starts with two and it ends with two. It starts with two because I is one already, and J starts with I plus one, one plus one is two. So that's why you know, we only got one iteration in the inner loop this time. So that means that when I equals to one, the entire term that is generated is G of one and P of two. That is generated when I equals to one. And I need to scroll again because you know, otherwise you know, these two sides you know, do not sync up. All right. But remember, I gets to go to two, okay? So now we look at this kind of weird case when I equals two. When I equals two, the G term is outside of the big N notation, so we still end up with something here. We end up with G of two because it is supposed to be G of I. However, <clears throat> in the inner loop, I, uh, J is supposed to start with I plus one, and it's supposed to end with N. But I is two, I plus one is a three, and that means we have no iteration through the inner loop because your start value is already greater than the end value. Is that okay? Are we doing okay so far with that concept? When your start value is greater than the end value, then you end up with zero iteration through that big end notation. So that means you know, this is it for when i equals to two. 
So now we have three terms generated on the left-hand side of the plus operator. One term is G2, one term is G1, P2, and one term is G0, P1, P2. And what are we supposed to do with those three terms? We are looking at this part here. We already figure out what term it is generated when i equals to zero, when i equals one, and when i equals to two. What are we supposed to do with those three terms? They're supposed to be ORed together. Very good. Okay, so now we know on the left-hand side, we're supposed to OR those three terms. So now we end up with G of two OR G of one, oops, G of one and P of two or uh, G of zero, P of one, and P of two. There we go, all right. So this is what we have at this point. Do we have any questions? Yep. That's, that's the way I spell out or now, yes. So I'm using the plus Instead of the or, I'm using multiplication instead of the end, just because it's easier to type. Because otherwise, I'm going to have to use the wedge symbol and all that. Yep. How do you know if uh, doing a construction and throwing the two together sounds like a thing? Because this is a Boolean expression. If, it's a, if it is a Boolean expression, we use Boolean operators. So I'm just overloading what looks like an addition to mean disjunction but there's no that that's not multiplication right. what looks like multiplication is conjunction okay. yep so this is a notational issue that is already that's actually addressed in the module so if you read the module it actually talks about this notation All right, so now <clears throat> we can handle the other side of the original addition symbol, okay? It's not an actual addition, so now we try to handle this side, which is K0, which is outside of the big N notation. This one is pretty easy because you, know, you can see how your I just go from zero to N, and do you guys want me to go through all the individual cases of I equals zero, I equals one, I equals two, or do you all understand that this is going to generate P0 and P1 and P2. Go ahead. The, the former or the latter? Do you want me to expand it? Or do you think we don't have to expand this one? Oh, okay. I get some of you, but not others. Okay, let's try it one more time. How many people want me to go over this one and expand it? Okay. All right, so we got about one third of the class who wants to expand that, okay. So I cannot show you both at the same time or I can actually just copy and paste it. All right, so let me just do this. Um, hmm, I'm not sure whether I can do that because I have VI key binding, we'll see. Nope, not that entire thing, nope. Uh, okay, I suppose I can, I can edit this until it works. Get rid of all this stuff. And we have to delete until the plus. DT And do it one more time. Oh. All right. Okay, there we go. So now we are focusing on this term. And it has three iterations, when i equals to zero, when i equals one, and also when i equals two. <clears throat> when i equals to zero, the, uh, this term here, p of i is just p of zero. So this is how p of zero is generated. When i equals one, we are just generating p of i, but since i is one, then we are generating p of one here. And when i equals two, then we are generating p of two, because i is two. So now we have three terms generated because of the big end notation. So what do we do with these three terms? End them together. That is very good. Okay. So now we know that we have to end P0, P1, P2 together. 
So we have P0, P1, P2, and they're all ended together. This is what the big end notation is generating. But this is not the entire expression, is it? Because you know, the entire expression is K0 and whatever the, the, that big end notation is generating. So that means you know, after you know, integrating the K0 into this entire thing, now we have K0, P, whoop, K0, P0, P, P of one, P of two. And that's what the right-hand side of the original plus looks like, okay? That's the last term. So now the entire term is going to be whatever is to the left, okay, which is uh, this term here, okay? So let me paste it here. And also, you know, I, I shouldn't say and, it's an or with, you know, whatever we just generated earlier, which is, you know, K0, P0, P1, P2. So now we put K0, P0, P1, oops, P underscore two. There we go. Yep. So when you have a term in front of the Yeah. It does not get distributed because it is the same operator. It is the same thing like, you know, two times the sigma of Okay, I take it back. Two plus the sigma of something. So all the sigma terms are added. So is the two in front of the you know, sigma notation because you know, that, that operator is really what the sigma operator is supposed to be doing anyway. So they, they, because of the associative law, they all get lumped together. Yep. Distribution only works when you have uh, one side is an operator like a multiplication. The other one has a addition then you use distribution. But since they're the same operator, we don't distribute. All right, so are we doing okay so far with this? You know, is that explaining how that <clears throat> really ugly looking expression is really doing? The really ugly you know, expression is this one. And each one of these, the big OR notation and the big AND notation and also this big AND notation is nothing more than a loop. And each iteration of the loop generates a term, and then we collect all those terms, and then then we apply whatever the big operator is supposed to be applying to those terms. Are we doing okay so far with this? This is yep. Yeah. Say again. See, uh, I cannot, sorry. Yes, when i equals two, you only have g2 because the inner loop does not go through a single iteration. No, no, the default is, what well, the default if with an and is a one because it is the identity of whatever the operator is. In that loop, in that loop, okay, can you speak a little bit slower so I, I, I'm, I'm not hearing. Yes. It gives you nothing. Okay, okay, I think I understand what you're saying. So let me, let me see if I can answer that question with the module itself. Okay. All right, did you read this part? The big N notation is a loop. So A is the starting point, B is the ending point. So the result of the big N notation is having a default result of a one first, which is a true. And then the loop starts with A. It, the last iteration has I being B, 
And then for each, after each iteration, it adds one to i. So if a is greater than b to begin with, then we have zero iterations, and result is just whatever result was. But since result is initialized to a true, so that means with zero iterations through the loop, we return a true. This is for big end. All right. So I'm going to emphasize again, you guys will hate me saying this all over again and again. This is probably the third time I say it today. Read the modules. Okay, it is really, really important to read this because that's, it's, it's here for a reason. It is here because you know, when you read it, okay, you may not fully understand what it is, but when I explain it in class, hopefully that will make the connection that is missing. Okay, so I cannot overemphasize the importance of reading the module itself. And this is, this kind of code, I expect this entire class to be able to read for the most part, okay? The part where I pass a pointer to a function into big or, that part is a little obscure, okay? You know, I know many, most people do not teach that in CISP 360, even though it should have been taught, okay? This is one of the really, important concepts leading to um, abstract methods in uh, object-oriented programming, okay? But, you know, I know it is not taught most of the time, but other than that, okay, the concept of having a loop, this is the starting point, this is the ending point, um, for each iteration we're just adding one to the counter, and we are ordering, you know, the result of each result you know, through the loop, um, that part should be understandable with a CISP 360 background. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. So are we ready to move on? Are we ready to conclude this particular module? All right, so let's talk about subtraction. So I am going to shift gear a little bit here because I need to use my tablet. So I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of magic here to get it work, to get it to work. All right, so we'll see whether that works or not. <clears throat> this tablet, unlike you know, most other tablets, does not like to do the network connection through the USB cable, which is the best way, the easiest way to get things done, but it doesn't want to do it that way. It wants to do it through the Wi-Fi network. And the Los Rios Wi-Fi network does not allow devices on the same network to talk to each other. So that means I have to attach another Wi-Fi card to my laptop computer so that I can make my own Wi-Fi network between this computer and the tablet. You know, so I have to basically implement an access point that is private between these two devices. And now I have to make this one to connect to the network that I just enabled. Okay, Move that. All right, then I turn on the tablet broadcast or mirroring you know, feature here, and then I can try to access that from here. I had to figure all this out before the end of the break because I knew that I would be using this in this semester. No, it's not working. All right, let's try this. Oh, it's it's still trying. Okay. I'm doing this so that everything is recorded. And of course, it is being recorded. Okay. All right. Doesn't seem like it wants to do it this time. Okay.
Nope, nope. All right, I have to redo this whole thing again. All right, let's try it one more time. If this doesn't work, you know, I can still, you know, use a text editor to do what I need to demonstrate. It's just, it just doesn't look as good. It's not as easy. Oh, okay. It's not cooperating today. All right, fine. We'll use the other way to do this. We're going to use a plain text editor to do this, just like all the previous semesters. All right, all right. So now we're going to talk about subtraction. And you go like subtraction. You know, we should know how to do that already. But let's figure out all the concepts that go into multi-digit base ten subtraction. So uh, oh, wrong keyboard. There we go. So we'll take a look at the example of let's say two hundred and. Uh, 213, okay, minus uh, 200 and mm, I have to I have to think about you know, which way to do it is um, okay we'd be 42 okay that's that's a good one because it exercises every single case that I want to talk about. So we're going to use the same format as the long format of multi-digit addition, except this time we are doing subtraction. So, so now I have all the spaces that I need. I just need to go back and change the digits one by one. So now I'm going to label the, the rows. This is X. This is Y. Okay, so same as usual. This is still called Q, okay, even though it is the single digit difference. And then this one is called T, and this one is called D for difference. So the labeling of the rows are a little bit different, but the concept is really kind of the same. So you look at the first column. The first column is easy. Three minus two. We don't have a problem with three minus two. It is a one. Okay, so we put a one over here. And then the this borrow bit here is a zero because there's nothing to borrow a one from column zero. Column zero is the least significant digit in this entire subtraction. So this is by default a zero. One minus zero is a one, okay? So I know in normal subtraction, you don't write out all of these things. You just say three minus two is a one, done, right? But in this case here, you know, I spell out all the intermediate terms because this way I can extract the relationship between all the digits so that I can mechanize the entire calculation. So do we have any questions about column zero or the rightmost column? Yep. Take away or take. I don't want to use the term borrow because B is the name of a function that we'll be talking about. Yep. All right. So any other questions about column zero, which is the rightmost column? Hmm? Um, because it is the least significant digit, so we don't have anything to borrow from column zero, and that's why it's a zero. For the same reason that K zero is always a zero, because you know, there's, there are no additional digits to the right-hand side of that column, so nothing is contributing a carry of one to that column. All right, any other questions? Nope, okay. So this is the interesting one because I'm asking you what is one minus four in base 10? Okay, so there are a few possible answers, right? The first or the most common answer if you just ask someone, especially at a college level of what is one minus four, the answer is negative three, okay? Perfectly fine as an answer. But if you ask an elementary school student what is one minus three, or you have one candy and I want three candies from you, then you know, the elementary school student would go like, I'm not sure what to tell you. I don't have enough you know, to give away to you. So 
That's why we have the concept of borrow. Very good. So when we borrow, we are borrowing from the digit to the left-hand side. In base 10, every time we say there's a borrow of one, we are borrowing one of 10, okay? So in this case, the one is not enough to do the subtraction of one minus four. I misspoke here of one minus three, but so the one is, is not enough because one is less than four. But once we borrow a one from the column to its left-hand side, then we have 11. We have the quantity of 11. 11 minus four, hey, we know the answer to that one. It's seven, okay? So seven is the answer in this case for this particular place because it is the single digit difference after quote unquote the subtraction with a borrow. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? Why it is a seven here? But because it has a borrow, we also have to remember to kind of mark it here and say, uh, digit two, I just borrowed one from you in order to get my you know, subtraction done. Is that okay? All right. So now we are left with seven minus a zero here. Now, wherever this cursor is, is a zero because three minus two does not need a borrow. One minus zero also does not need a borrow. So we are not having a borrow of one from column zero. Say that one with that? Uh huh. That's a zero because it is the least significant digit. You mean this one? Yep. So this one is a zero because it is the least significant digit. But this one is a zero because three minus two does not need a borrow. One minus a zero also does not need a borrow. So this is a zero here. And then the difference is the seven minus the zero, which is just a seven here, which also does not need a borrow. Seven minus zero does not need a borrow. So now we are working on the most significant digit and we start with two minus two. So what is the single digit difference of two minus two? Zero, do we need a borrow? No, okay. So we put a zero here and now we have zero, which is our single digit difference from x, y, x minus y, minus this one. So what is zero minus one in base 10? We, yep, it's, it has a single digit difference of a nine and a borrow of one. So this entire calculation has an overall borrow of one from digit three. What does that mean? What does it mean when I say I have a borrow of one from digit three? What does that one representing? It is one of what? Since it's digit three, 1,000. Exactly, we are borrowing 1,000. Does that make sense? Okay, let's try to figure this out. 213 minus 242 is 971, but we also have a borrow of 1,000. It does work out, okay? It's just a really weird way to say um, negative 29. It really is saying 29, negative 29, except it's a weird way to say it. It's basically saying, yeah, you have 971 bucks in your pocket, but you owe the bank $1,000. What is your net worth? Negative $29. Is that okay? And this is why we don't need um, you know, currency that has a negative in front of it, because we have the concept of, yeah, you owe the bank or whoever is loaning money to you. Is that okay? Are we doing okay so far with the concept of borrowing and the concept of the single digit difference? Uh, we got two hands. Okay, so uh, you first. Okay, so are you talking about column zero? Column two. 
So the two minus the two has a zero, but the borrow is marked here. So we separate the two steps. When we perform subtraction normally, we combine the steps. We basically just mark, oh, we have subtracting one, so we cross out the bottom two and turn it into a one, or something like that. No, we, I take it back. We, we cross out the top two and we turn it into a one. But when we do it this way, we have one specific role, and its only job is to ask, did we borrow something from the next digit? And that's the T row. The Q row, on the other hand, is just figuring out what is the single digit difference of X and Y. The difference, or the D row, is also the single digit difference between Q and T. Is that okay? So I'm really spelling out and um, making more digits visible than you normally do when you are doing it by hand. The reason why I'm doing this is because this is the only way that we can extract the structure of multi-digit subtraction so that we can turn it into something that is mechanical. Are we still doing okay so far with these concepts? All right. So if we understand you know, how base 10 subtraction is done this way, so let me ask you this question. If I define, okay, so once again, you know, these are definitions, which means you know, if you have not you know, written these definitions in your notes already, it's a good idea to write it down, okay? So now we're defining Q of I. This is why I prefer to use, um, well, you know what? I can now switch back to the, to Joplin because you know, that way I can actually use a subscript. You guys can tell me which way you prefer. You know, I can do it either way. So I'm gonna switch back to Joplin here and define those terms. Okay. So the problem is you know, when I do it this way, you lose visibility of the uh, stuff that I did earlier. There's a way for me to actually copy that into the other side too. Give me a second here. Because I need four spaces ahead of everything. Yep, so there are four spaces ahead, okay. So I might be able to do it. Copy and paste. I think it, yeah, it does not work out because it mistook the, uh, I can put it in a block, but you know. Yeah, I know, but I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> okay, so that still works out. Okay, but it's doing syntax highlighting that not the way that I wanted to do. I'm not sure whether this Yeah, text is fine. All right. So now we still have this captured here. So the next question is can I if I extend or stretch this screen, is it okay for the people in the back? Can you guys still see everything? Okay. All right. So that because I want to keep the subtraction in scope when I describe you know, how digits relate to each other. All right, so um, x of i is a digit of the minuend. Minuend, yep. Mm -hmm. And then y of i is a digit of the subtrahend. So these are just terms, you know, you know, if you do not remember these terms, you know, now I'm telling you that these are the terms, okay? The value where a quantity is subtracted from is called the minuend, which is our x. The quantity that we are taking away from the minuend is called the subtrahend. Do you guys still remember those terms? No? You can look it up. <laughs> Wikipedia is great, okay, you know, if you just look up these terms. So in this case, it is important you know, to know which one is the uh, minuend and which one is the subtrahend, you know, because addition is um, commutative, which means you know, x plus y is the same as y plus x, so it doesn't matter you know, what term we give x and y. But subtraction is not commutative, and that's why we have to give these two you know, its specific term. Okay, I just mentioned a particular term, commutative. What does that mean? Okay, what do you mean by either way? <laughs> yes, go ahead.
That is correct. So when you switch position on the two sides of the operator, it does not change the resulting value. So addition is commutative, but subtraction is not commutative. All right. So those are algebraic terms you know, that should be introduced in, okay, I actually looked this up, math one or algebra one in high school. All right, so moving on. <clears throat> so now we have Q of I. So Q of I is, I would say, you know, the result single digit uh, difference between X of I and Y of I. Okay, so we'll define R in just a little bit, okay? And then we have the T term, but we'll deal with the T terms later. The D of I is the R of the Q of I and the T of I. Okay, and then now we have the T of I. The T of I is a little bit tricky because you know, we actually have to say what is T of I plus one because you know, do we have a borrow from the column next to us to the left hand side is determined by whether we have a borrow from uh, because of xi minus yi or uh, do we have a borrow of when we subtract ti from qi. Okay. So we, I'm just going to pause here a little bit. So if you guys look at this and go like, that looks awfully familiar, structurally speaking, good job, okay? Because you're recognizing the pattern, something that we have seen before, even though we were using slightly different row terms, okay? But this looks the same as addition, okay? So I'll get to that part in just a little bit because there was a question, go ahead. So C is determining, is the sum between these two single digit too much for a single digit to represent? That's what the C function is trying to determine. The B function is trying to determine, um, does the first parameter have enough value to have that much subtracted from it? That's what the B function is trying to determine. So one is trying to determine, do we have a carry of one or do we have a carry of zero? The other one is determining what do we have a borrow of one or do we have a borrow of zero? It is also Boolean, yes. Well, it's either a zero or one, yeah. yep. All right, so yeah, go ahead. Yep, yep, mm-hmm. So the R is defined differently too, but there's a reason why I kept using the term R of something. So we'll, we'll get to see that later, okay? So now we want to figure out exactly what the R function looks like, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at that, okay? And I want to zoom out a little bit because I want to show the original calculation so that you guys can figure out the actual function, how it's defined. So we have R of UV. I try to avoid the use of XY so there's no confusion. So U and V are really just names of the parameters. So how do we define R of UV? In other words, the R of 3, 2 is a 1. The R of 1, 4 is a 7. The R of 2, 2 is a 0. The R of 1, 0 is a 1. The R of 0, 1 is a 9. So can someone suggest how we can compute, how we can express the function r? Yes, go ahead. Then you have to, okay, so you're adding the base to you and then subtract v from it if v is larger than u. Yeah. Does that? Okay, otherwise it's a normal subtraction. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Yes, yep, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, 
that would do it too. So now I don't need the condition, but both would get the job done. Okay, so I'm going to express both here. So one way to express it, which is also in the notes, is the base, whatever the base is, which in this case is base 10. So you add 10 to u regardless before you do the subtraction of v. But then you say, but what if u is already greater than or equal to v? Not a problem. Mod this entire thing if it's 10 in this case. So that would take care of the case where um, u is actually greater than v to begin with. Let's say 3 minus 2, okay? So 10 plus 3 is 13. 13 minus 2 is 11. 11 mod 10 is 1, okay? So we get back to the original you know, value. So the other way to express this is, like you said, using a conditional statement or use a condition to decide what we need to do. So um, that would be... Um, if u is less than v, then we have a value of 10. Otherwise, we have a value of 0. And then plus u minus v. <laughs> that would also accomplish the same thing, except I'm using the ternary expression to handle that case. So the ternary expression is really just determining, do we have to pre-add a 10 to the u first, because u is less than v to begin with, or do we have to just not add anything to u first? So that's just another way of ex expressing what you mentioned earlier. But they accomplish the same thing, okay? The, board, the bottom line is they, they accomplish exactly the same thing. All right, so we can plug it in you know, to some of these values, one and four, okay? Let's try to figure that out. So we're trying to figure out what is r of one, four, okay? Using the first method, 10 plus one is 11, 11 minus 4 is 7, and 7 mod 10 is still 7. Okay, that works. What about the second method? 1 is less than 4 is true, so we use the 10 here. This 10 is added to the 1, which is 11. The 11, we take 7 away from the 11, which is also 4. So that works out too. It's just, you know, which way looks more natural to you. Take your pick. Yep. I don't know if this actually works or not, but let's just say that it's greater than this and you add something that is better and you add something that is better. Add. Mm, you're not adding one. You're adding whatever the base is. Okay, yeah. So in this case, you're, you're adding base 10. But then, you, okay, so let, let's see why you know, I'm not, I did not use that approach. Okay, so let's. Let's use that approach. So if u is less than v, then we have 10 plus u minus v. Otherwise, we just have u minus v. I think that is what you are trying to express, right? I mean, this is, this is what you're trying to say, right? And I'm going to use extra parentheses just to emphasize. The parentheses, by the way, are not needed in this case because the ternary operator has the least, oper least priority compared to addition, subtraction, and all that stuff. So the parentheses are actually not needed. So this works too, okay? If u is less than v, then we pre-add 10 to u, and then we take away v. If u is not less than v, then we just say, just subtract v from u, we're fine. So that works too. So now the question is, why did I use this approach, which is really just using the ternary expression, to decide whether to pre-add a 10 or a 0, but keeping u minus v the same way. So why do you think I did it that way? Um, not exactly because it's, because it's faster. Because I don't like copy and paste. When I see u minus v and u minus v, I go like, what if I mistype something in one of those cases? So I don't want to duplicate a sub-expression unless it is necessary. So in this case, it is not necessary because I can use this approach so that u minus v only appears once. So if I mess up, it will mess up both cases, which makes it easier to debug because I don't have to say, oh, in some cases, it works out okay. In some other cases, it does not work. So you know, if it messes up in all cases, it's an easy bug to fix and detect. If it only messes up in some cases but not other cases, 
then you have a trickier problem to deal with. So that's the reason why I chose the first way and not the second way. But the second way is equivalent. It, it works too. And the first, the zeroth way, the first way here, does not even bother to ask the question. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just adding 10 regardless. So are we good with uh, the R function? Okay. What about the B function? Okay. The B function is used to compute the T term. So in this case, there's a one here. Okay, let me scroll up a little bit so you can see the actual reason. There's a one here because one minus four requires a borrow. And that's why we borrow one and that one shows up here. There's a one here, because, not because two minus two requires a borrow, but because zero minus one requires a borrow. So in both cases, it would seem to me that we have to return a value of one if and only if uh, the minimum in the calculation is less than the subtrahend in the calculation. Okay, so let's let's put it into function terms and see if we can uh, express it. Okay, so we are looking at b of u v is okay. How would you define it? Mm -hmm. Yep, if u is less than v, which is exactly the same thing as you said, except, you know, I turn it around a little bit. If that is the case, we turn to 1, otherwise we turn to 0. Yep. If they are, oh, you tell me. <laughs> if u and v are the same, what happens to this expression? It is false. So that means with a ternary expression, what value is it going to return? The zero. Does it make sense? Two minus two, does it need a borrow? Nope. So it, this works correctly when u and v are the same. All right. So are we doing okay so far with this? So we can see a resemblance to the addition stuff, right? The addition stuff has a different way of doing the R function, has a different way of doing the C function. But when you look at how the Q of I relates to X and Y, when you look at how the S of I relates to Q and K in the case of addition, that structure is still there. When you look at K of I plus one and using the C of X, I, Y, I, or the C of Q, I, T, I, that structure is also retained. So that means Hmm, I guess subtraction and addition are not that different after all. Because structurally, structurally speaking, the way we perform addition and the way we perform subtraction, multi-digit you know, subtraction and addition, the structure is the same. It's just that the little detail is a little bit different. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. Attack. This only works in base 10. What, what, if, what if we want to do it in base 2? Then what, what do we need to do? Yes? Change all the 10s to 2s. OK, very good. Let's, let's do that, OK? So now we say in base 2. Um, in base 2, does any, is, is Q of i affected in base 2, how it is related to x i, y i? No. What about the d of i? No. What about T of I plus one? No, the only thing that needs to change is how R is defined. B does not even care, okay? Look at B. Where is the 10 in the definition of the B function? It's nowhere to be seen. It does not even care about the base. So the only thing that has to be rewritten is the R function. So let's go ahead and rewrite the R function, okay? So I'm gonna use the lazy approach dot slash dot substitute 10 with 2 globally. There we go. This is all we have to do to make it work in base 2. Are we still doing OK so far with this? All right. Go like, hmm, OK, that's kind of cool. But I thought the whole, the whole idea 
is to do all of this using transistors. Okay, we know how to use 2P, 2N transistors to make a NAND gate. We know how to use NAND gates to make negation, conjunction, and disjunction, right? But that's about all we know, okay? You know, and this is not it, because the you know, mod is ugly. It, is, it involves division. Um, this is addition, this is subtraction, this is comparison. We don't know how to do all of those things in using transistors, using logic gates. So do you remember what we did in addition? What is the transition so that we can use logic gates? We try, we tr at least try to convert all of these into Boolean operations, which means um, we just make a table. We just make a table out of this using the existing definition of R and B, and then we try to figure out, is there another way to give us exactly the same value given you know, what U and B are? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll try that out here. So we'll basically, uh, I guess you know, this will work, okay. I'm using a text block here so that I can use a fixed width font. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this is U, this is B, uh, this is R of UV, and this is B of UV. Okay, and this is all in base two. So in base two, what are the possible values of U? Zero or one, very good, zero or one. What about V? Zero or one. But when U is zero, V can be zero or one. When U is one, V can also be zero or one because these two variables are independent to each other, okay? So the key word here is they are independent to each other. Okay, so can someone tell me what is, oops, uh, what is the R of zero, zero? Zero, okay, what is the R of zero, one? This is the only tricky one. It's one, very good. What is the uh, R of one, zero? That's an easy one too, just one. And what is the R of one, one? Okay, very good, excellent. What about B? Uh, what is the B of zero, zero? Zero, what is the B of zero, one? Good job. And what is the B of one, zero? And what is the B of 1, 1? All right, cool. So now we look at each of these columns and go like, okay, can we do this using just Boolean operators? That's the magical step, okay? Because we are now trying to convert arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, comparison, and division into something that we can do with transistors, which would be negation, conjunction, and disjunction, okay? So we look at, let's focus on something that is super familiar first, which is R of UV. Does this look familiar to you? Exactly, it's like, we, we know this already, okay? So can someone tell me how R can be uh, implemented as using Boolean operators? Exclusive or, okay, that works, okay. So it's called the O plus operator. You know, if you try to enter that using the, the symbol here, it's the same way as addition, okay. So, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And then when you look at the B function, it looks like, ugh, okay, it's almost an and, but it's not. Because, you know, we want it to be a one when U is false and V is true. That is our ticket. What did I just say? We want B of UV to be true when U is false and V is true. No, exclusive or is not going to work here. Yes. Yep, that's it. Okay. So the, okay, I'm going to use the long way to spell it out first and then, um, and then we'll work out so we want the negation of U um, and V. Okay, I'm going to spell out and this time. That's and. Or if you prefer, we can use ampersand, ampersand. Uh, TT. 
not sure what it nope does not like that i might if we need if i might need to escape those first there we go <laughs> okay if we negate u first and then end that with v i get that but does that work out with all of the other rows okay let's check it out uh, let's pick the last row here, okay? You know, in, on the last row, u is 1, u, v is 1, 2. So we have not 1, which is a 0, done. Because we want the result to be a 0, okay? If one side of the conjunction is a false, the whole thing is going to be false. That works out. Um, so we want to find something where you know, not u is true, but the entire thing is false. So what about the first row? u is false. So u is false, not u is true, and v, but v is false here, so the and with v will also turn the entire conjunction to false. Ah, that works out too. So if you work this out, you know, work out for every single case, you will find that when v is defined this way, it works out, okay? And I'm just gonna you know, use the normal notation, okay? This is the way I would write it because I keep the exclamation point to mean negation because it's easy to type. Um, but then I use you know the uh, what looks like multiplication to mean conjunction. And negation, the negation operator has the highest operator priority. So that means if I want to add additional parentheses to clarify this, the parentheses will be around the not u. All right, so are we still doing okay so far? And no one thinks this is a really cool moment. Because we, we have just converted arithmetic operations into Boolean operations. And we know that Boolean operations, the one that we are using here, can easily be done using the NAND gate. And we know NAND gates can be done using two P and two N type transistors. So that means, oh, so you're telling me that we now know how to do subtraction using transistors. Yes, that is why this is a cool moment because you know, we are no longer dependent on arithmetic operations. We are now doing something that transistors can do, logic gates can do. Looking at the time, let's go ahead and take row first, okay, and then we'll come back and continue with this discussion. So we'll go to, okay, where's my browser? There we go. And, oh, this is not the right one. Ah, where's the right one? Yep, this is the right, nope, oh, this is not the right one. Oh. Okay, that's okay, I can get there. Uh, so 2024241, there we go. All right, so I'm kind of I'm making it visible now. You can see it, and the access code is on the next screen. It is elementary. Mm -hmm. It is locked. Oh, because of, of the time. Okay, I did set it up to have expired already. I thought I set it up to uh, 640, but no, I put, that's not the time. All right, let's do it one more time. All right, refresh and see if we can get you. And the passcode is elementary. Hmm? This is all addition and subtraction. What is difficult about this whole thing is the abstraction process. That is the difficult part. How we went from a concrete case of base 10 subtraction 
to how the digits relate to each other. Then we extract, you know, how do we compute the, um, the Q and the T and also the D. And then from there, we do the conversion to base two. And then from there, we convert to using transistors or logic gates. So it's a long chain of reasoning to, and we started off with something that is elementary to begin with, but the process of transitioning to base two and implementing subtraction, in this case, using logic gates, is not elementary. But we did start with something that was elementary, which was base 10 subtraction. So are we good with uh, row taking? Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right, so let me show you guys where we are in terms of the modules or the reading content you know, that are linked from the Canvas shell. So we are done with binary number addition, and we are currently in binary number subtraction, or binary number subtraction is right here. So as I mentioned, you know, in the first class, I just moved down the list, okay? You know, all of these linked material, you know, they basically point to content that you need to read. And I would talk about these things in class. I would use examples to illustrate. I'll explain, I would try to explain the connections. But ultimately, reading the modules is important. So we are now in here. So might as well turn, you know, take a look at what's here. Subtraction binary numbers, okay? So it looks pretty much the same stuff that we talked about. We derived you know, the equations. So now <clears throat> we do about the same thing, except this one is eh, it's actually a little bit uglier than before. So do you remember this thing? T of I plus one is blah, 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 blah. Okay, let me, let me switch to Joplin because we have seen it already today. We just saw it earlier, which is right here. Is that okay? All right, so this is the same thing as this thing here. And then I use bo uh, Boolean algebra to go all the way down here. The intermediate steps are not important, okay? This is not CISP 440, so we are not learning how to use the Boolean algebra to do derivation. But the bottom line is, the whole idea is, Originally, T of I plus one depends, of T, depends on T of I, just like K of I plus one depended on K of I, which means we can quite easily uh, implement a borrow ripple subtractor, just like you know, we implemented a carry ripple adder in the previous class, or two, previous, two classes ago. But that's not good, okay? Because it means if you have a 64-bit subtractor, it would take twice as long as a 32-bit subtractor. A 32-bit subtractor would take twice as long as a 16-bit subtractor, and so on. Because you know, the amount of time it takes for the subtractor to finish its job is proportional to the number of bits that you're subtracting, okay? So can we get around that problem, okay? It looks like we have, we're not there yet, okay? Because even after all this derivation, you can see how T of I plus one still depends on T of I here. Is that okay? But you also see that, oh, but wait, hold on a second here. We got something here, and then we got something that T of I is ending with, just like the scenario that we had in addition. There's a very slight difference between this and the addition you know, example, which is x of i is now negated first. But that's the only difference. So when I scroll down a little bit, you can see that now we redefine, okay? There's a reason why the re is underlined, because when we were talking about addition, x of i was not negated first but we are now redefining the terms of your P of I and G of I, so that G of I is the negation of X of I and Y of I. P of I is the negation of X of I or Y of I. 
So with those two terms defined the way that they are now, I can now rewrite t of i plus 1 to be g of i or p of i and t of i. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. Does that make sense to you? You don't have to understand Boolean algebra to get this, right? Because all we are looking at is, oh, this whole thing is just called g of i, and it becomes g of i over here. This entire thing, by the definition of p of i, is just p of i, so we can simplify this expression to become this expression here. Is that okay? So this does not involve the use of Boolean algebra. It is substitution based on how the terms are defined. Does that look familiar to you? You're like, yeah, last time we saw it as k of i plus 1 is g of i or p of i and k of i. Tech, I think we just switched the letters around. We just substituted all the k's with t's, and now we got this. Does anyone have this realization? Yes. Yes, and that has to do with how p of i and g of i are defined. But once we define, you know, once we redefine g of i and p of i with a negation of x of i first, then the rest looks like, hey, that looks awfully familiar, which means all the tricks that we did in order to figure out how to express k of 2 without referring to k of 1, how to express k of 3 without referring to k of 2, they still work exactly the same way here, which means we still end up, we basically end up with exactly the same thing as before. And as a result, the general expression to generate t of n plus 1 looks like this. You go like, tech, aren't we really just changing all the k's to t's? The answer is yes, we are. If you know how to make a carry look-ahead adder, you already have, for the most part, a borrow look-ahead subtractor because they are that similar. Okay, so do we have any questions? Yep. Okay, so I still have that note here. So that's module 283. So the way, the way we did it with addition was we work out k of 1 first, right? So k of 1 is, you know, so when, when we're trying to figure out k of 1, i equals to 0, right? So that means here you know, we have g of 0 or p of 0 and k of 0, which is what we have here. Now that one cannot be reduced any further because k of 0 is one of the inputs, is one of the things that are given to you, so it's not computed from something else. So k of 1 cannot be simplified any further. It has to depend on k of 0. There's no other way to do it. But when we look at k of 2, and then we reapply this you know, overall equation here, then we go like, okay, if we need to figure out what is k of 2, then i equals to 1. So when i equals to 1, then we have g of 1 or p of 1, k of 1 on the other side. Okay? But by this time, we already know what k of 1 looks like. That's k of 1. So we do a substitution the other way around. We say k of 1 is really this mess here. So we, we, put, we, we slapped that mess in place of k of 1. But the end result is there's no k of 1 anymore. This entire second row does not mention k of 1 anymore. So in a sense, we have already accomplished what we wanted to do. But somebody may, may say, but this expression is harder to evaluate. It's going to take, as, you know, take as long to do it just like the other way. So after this, we applied distribution. So we end up with this term here. But this term is special because when you do it by hand, Yes, it will take you a long time to do it because you know, when people do Boolean expressions, we do it sequentially. But when you use logic gates to do it, which is something that I demonstrated in the previous class, the way the, trans the, the, way the gates are structured is 
these two conjunctions can occur at the same time. So that means this entire conjunction and this entire conjunction will give us their own result at the same time. And then we can have an OR gate that can take three inputs to compute the result of the OR in one single propagational delay. So that is how we get it to go fast, okay, is so that we can have multiple conjunction gates to perform all the conjunctions at exactly the same time. And we cannot do it like that. Humans cannot do, uh, cannot process expressions, you know, and say, okay, all of these parts are computed at the same time, and then we just have some overall operation to connect all the parts. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So it's more obvious when we are applying K of three, because in order to figure out what is K of three, I equals to two, right? So K of three, using that expression you know, all the way up there, is going to be G of two or P of two and K of two, okay? But we know what K of two is. K of two is this big mass here. So now we slap that big mass in place of K two like this. So immediately, the reference to K of K2 is gone. We only got you know, references to K0 now. But then we also use some distribution. So this time, we end up with one, two, three conjunctions. But the three conjunctions can be done, can be computed at the same time using three different conjunction or AND gates. So when these three conjunctions are done at the same time, this is already around, so we don't need time for that one. So now we have four individual components for the OR, for the disjunction to, to compute. But we can have a four input OR gate so that it will take all four inputs at the same time and give us the result in one single propagational delay. That concept of your propagational delay was uh, discussed last time. Yep. So it's the same way in subtraction. The only change in subtraction is change all the k's to t's, change the way we, cha we define um, p, p and g by negating x first. That's it. Yep. Huh? Not necessarily, because we can stack you know, additions. OK, so the concept of stacking addition is what if the hardware of your processor is only capable of doing 16-bit additions? And now you give it a two 64-bit integers to add, right? So you have four 16-bit uh, additions. The first 16-bit addition will give you an overall carry. That becomes the K0 of the next 16-bit addition. That will also give your carry out that carry out becomes carry in, which is K0 of the third um, edition, and then you have the fourth edition. So that's why K0, which is also known as K in, or carry in, is so important, because it allows you to break down a longer or wider edition into smaller chunks so that you know, your hardware can handle it. You can use an AB processor, to, to do a 64-bit addition, it would just take eight individual additions to get it done, but it can be done. So does that kind of answer your question? Yes. K0 is an input pin. It is also known as carry in to the adder because you know, that's the one thing that it says, okay, did we have a prior addition before the one that I'm, try that I'm attempting now? Because if we did, the carry out of that addition should be incorporated into my carry in, which is also just K0 in this case. Yep. You need four 16-bit additions, right? So, okay, so I know what you're asking. So something has to retain the uh, individual results, and also to retain the carry out from the previous edition so that it becomes the carry in of the next edition. So that concept we'll talk about much later you know, when we actually talk about the instruction set. Yep. 
Um, so don't leave yet, because if you leave now, you won't know the access code to the lab. So we are going to have a lab today, and this one does involve the use of Logisim, because we are actually starting to build a 3-bit by 3-bit carry look-ahead adder. So the access code of the lab portion is 3x3 part 1, 3 by 3 part 1. So you might want to write it down. <clears throat> or you can, you can hang out with people whom you think will remember this. You can just then ask that person. It's like, what is the access code again? All righty. So I'll see you guys at the lab. <laughs>